good morning. Isn't it good to be together with our Buford Church family uh, on this beautiful morning? Um, it is always a, get, a joy to get to gather together on a, on a Sunday, uh, to, to be together. Uh, and, and I'll tell you this, I hope that uh, you make plans to be back this evening. Um, if you have been with us on Sunday evenings to this year, we've been focusing in on specific topics on Sunday evenings, uh, like throughout a singular month. And this month, it's a new month, so we get to start something new this month. And we're going to be throughout the entire month looking at healing in the home. And it's all going to be capped off by Focus Sunday um, at the end of the month, which is going to be absolutely uh, phenomenal. And so I hope you come back tonight. Uh, tonight we are starting out with a, a time of song where we look at this idea of healing in the home and, and song and discussion and prayer and scripture. And every single one of these services I've been blessed to be a part of has been uplifting and encouraging and I've left feeling spirit filled. And so I hope you make plans to be back tonight. I think that, that you will be uh, blessed from that. Um, Kyle has been in the midst of this lesson series where he's looking at idols um, and idols that we might experience in our lives today. I don't know about you, I have found myself feeling incredibly called out throughout this series. Um, when I look at who I am and in my life and the things that I go through on a daily basis, I find myself at a place, um, and, and I don't know if it's just just the fact that, that we are so blessed as a nation, as an area, but so faced with things constantly that I would consider idols. And, and what we're not going to do, you might, we don't have like the logo on the screen. Uh, this morning, instead of sitting here and directly continuing this series, what I wanted us to do was spend a little bit of time uh, investing in kind of a an idea that as we look at this idea of idols uh, that we are faced with, as I go out into life and say, okay, I want to battle the idols that I'm dealing with on a daily basis. I want to sit there and fight against my struggle and temptation to let those idols exist in my life. What is a way I can do that? And I believe that what we get to look at this morning is something that can help me uh, look at idols and I hopefully purify myself um, from dealing with those in a lot of ways. And so uh, what I want us to do is look into the life of Jesus and look at words that he is going to say pretty consistently and also spend some time in the Psalms to allow ourselves to sit here and say, okay, what is a Jesus recommendation? Always a good thing. Jesus approved. What is a Jesus recommendation on ways that as I look to approach the world, I can allow myself to stay pure? So if you want to open up your Bibles to John chapter 10, we are going to be there in just a moment. Now, uh, I will say I do not have every verse that we're going to read on slides this morning. I did this intentionally. I, I would love for you to open up your Bibles and be present. I find that uh, when I can sit there and like we can study together by having our Bibles open. So uh, I will have a few up there, um, but we'll begin in just a minute in John 10. I also want to start out with this disclaimer a little bit, uh, is that there are going to be a few moments where I think that this can be like, where are we going with this? Um, why, like, how are these things connecting? They, they do connect, and, and so I hope that, like, I hope that you can kind of stick with us for a little bit and let us, uh, and let us kind of track together through a few different ideas. And I think when we get to the end, it's like it, it should all come together. We'll be like, wow, that's incredible. Or at least that's, that's how I felt uh, when I was doing this study on this. So hang in there. I think it's pretty exhilarating as we, as we look to wrap up in the end of this lesson. We're in John chapter 10. Uh, Jesus is in the process of talking to the Jews about how he and the Father are the same, how they are one individual. And, uh, and of course, as no spiritual person would be who has somebody who comes into their atmosphere and starts saying that they are God, they're, they're not happy people. Look at verse 30. Jesus says this phrase, I and the Father are one. It's a bold statement. It better be true, because if it's not true, uh, Jesus is one of the most evil people who's ever lived. And he comes to earth and he looks at these individuals who are very spiritual individuals, these Jewish individuals who had a spiritual mindset on everything. And he says, look, I and the Father are one. Verse 31, how do the Jews respond? The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Now, here's the deal. 
The Jews are going to pick up stones to stone him in this moment because the law stated that if blasphemy was committed, what you had to do is take the individual who's committed blasphemy and take him to the outside of the town and stone them. And so in this moment, Jesus is going to say, I and the Father are one. And the Jews say, we know what we got to do with people like this. We know what we got to do with the individuals who are going to sit there and claim that they and the Father God are one. That, that they and Yahweh, their, their God, are one. We got to take them outside the city and kill them. And I love how G, they, they know the law. They know exactly what they have to do. They know what the right thing to do is. And I love how Jesus is like, wait, before you take me outside the city and stone me, let me talk to you a little bit more. And they, I think it's just kind of funny that they stop and, and listen. Um, and they're like, okay, we'll give you a second. But he says to them in verse 32, he says, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. He's been doing all these miracles. Hey, I've shown you a lot of really good things, a lot of beautiful things from the Father. Then he says, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you. No, 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 we understand you've been doing the good things. We see you healing. We see the miracles. We saw all the amazing things that you're doing. You, that, don't get a, that we're not stoning you for that reason. Why do they say that they're doing this? What is that in the end of verse 33? It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you being a man, make yourself God. I like to place myself in the mindset of the people who encounter Jesus when I read his story. Um, because I think that, the, that sometimes we're a little bit unfair when you have the Son of God sitting there. I think he would make everyone around him look uh, like, like insufficient. If like, I were to sit next to Jesus and they were to write down our conversation, they'd be like, that Ben guy's a total doofus. You know, like that's how, that's how it would feel from afar, right? And so I kind of like to place myself in the situation of those who Jesus is, is talking with and, and, and having encounters with. And I think that when we sit here and look at this story, the Jews are actually pretty relatable. I mean, yes, Jesus is doing a lot of amazing things. That's true. Uh, Jesus has done a lot of miracles. That's true. Jesus has healed the sick. That's true. Jesus is an expert teacher. That's true. But he just called himself God. And I think that if you and I were sitting there in that instance... And we had somebody walk into this room who, who could heal the sick and could do many miracles and could sit there and, and teach beautiful messages from this pulpit. We would say, wow, they're amazing. And the second they sat there and said, oh, by the way, I'm, a, I'm God on earth. We would say, no, you're not. And immediately have that reaction. Because I think that in this moment, we sit here and process this. They're sitting here, and these are very spiritual individuals who have been sitting here studying who God is for a long time. And they are sitting here, and they suddenly have this individual who is coming to them and saying, I am God. And here's the thing about the Jews in this moment. They were in a place where, where they were watching uh, where they were watching Jesus do everything that we could ever imagine that is beautiful, yet I think we would still struggle with the same thing. Look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, and, and, and this, is, this is the way he says this. I, I don't know how you imagine him saying this next phrase, but it's interesting. Jesus said to them, answered them, is it not written in your law? Now, I have to stop here. He is, he is talking to the Jews as Jesus, who is a part of God, God one and three. And he says, is it not written in your law? The law that he wrote, the law that he was a part of. And he looks at them and in this moment they have taken the law and perverted it to a place where he's looking at them and saying, is it not written in your law? The law, yeah, I gave this law to you, but you have taken this. He says, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God's. Now, we just, Kent just read this beautifully for us um, from Psalm 82. This is a reference directly out of Psalm 82. And Psalm 82 is this psalm uh, where God is looking at these individuals and he's going to uh, reference them as God's. Notice the lowercase g. 
in that moment, these are most likely, if we kind of look at similar language, uh, referencing like, like the hosts of God. Um, these would be like lowercase. Uh, well, we won't get into like the Greek, but it's like this, this idea of, of these holy individuals, these um, kind of eternal individuals who are sent in to judge the world. Um, and, and there's a big conversation that we could go with on that. But what we see in Psalm 82, if you were, if you were processing uh, the reading of that psalm, uh, what you would see is that this is a psalm that says, God's looking at these individuals and he's saying, you've done a really bad job at judging the world. You have done an incredibly poor job. We might have it all up there. That's really tough to see. But, but if you want to look at it as we kind of process this, God's looking at these individuals and he says, look, you have done a very poor job at judging the world in this moment. You have, you have taken my commands and you have let people run crazy. You have done whatever they want to do. And here's the deal. Jesus is looking at the Jews in this moment and he's not calling the Jews these Jewish leaders, he's not looking at them and saying, you are these eternal beings. But he is looking at them and he's saying, look, we gave you the law. We gave you this beautiful set of, of things that you can live by so that you can stay in a place where you're in relationship with God. If you remember uh, in, when they received the tablets, they came into fellowship with God um, in that moment in Exodus. And he sits there and he says, okay, look, you have been given all the things that you need to stay pure with the law, and yet you are still in a place where you have allowed evil constantly to come into the Jews, to come into the people of God. Their judgment has allowed uh, and, and condemned and condoned certain parts of life, has allowed everyone to seek themselves over the Lord. And he's looking at them and he's, he's, Jesus in John 10 is looking at the Jews and he, and he quotes this psalm and he says, you have been given the, all the law, you've been given the words of me and what you have done is you've totally missed what is being said in the law. With all the law and the prophets, there's one thing that it points to. And boy, oh boy, this would be a fun thing to get to, to, get to enjoy, like studying in a series. But as you sit there and look at all the law and all the prophets and all the Psalms and all of it, what does it do? It points to Jesus Christ. And he sits here and he says, look, you've been given every single bit of this. And you've missed me through it. You have all the word of God there and you have missed the savior of the world. Buford family, I am afraid that there are moments when we do this exact thing. I'm afraid that there are moments when we have a love for the law so much. And don't mishear me and think that I'm saying that this is not important because it is, it is vitally important. But where we get so obsessed with the, the little things that are, we are called to live by that we miss the Savior who we're called to live in. And we sit here and we, we approach the Word of God and instead of allowing the Word of God to lead us to purity, where we sit here and, and when we're looking at life, we sit there and we say, oh, those idols of the world that make me obsessed with things over Jesus. Instead of letting the word of God lead me to a place where I, that stuff isn't fascinating to me. That stuff isn't a temptation to me. We sit here and we still are attached to it because we take the law and instead of letting ourselves attach it to the Savior, we allow it to lead us to arguing and controversy and hate towards other people. And Jesus brings up this psalm, Psalm 82, and says, look, my people, you haven't allowed the word of God to do what it's supposed to do, which is lead people to me. And so he looks at him and says, you've been these judges. You've been the ones who have done this exact thing mentioned in Psalm 82. And I think it's interesting. The Jews probably aren't sitting here like super upset about this. They're like, yes, we do know the law. Yes, we can judge. We can do all these different things. And they're, they're probably in a place where they loved the idea of the law empowering them. And so Jesus has caught them in this middle place of, of where they're like, man, like 
it's kind of cool that he's referencing us as judges, but also terrible because that passage in Psalm 82 that he just referenced is saying that they are totally failing. And so he's sitting here and he, he lays that on them and that's heavy for somebody to receive. And then he does what he always does and what we should always do, always do and he brings the conversation back to himself. And look at the, the way he does this, starting in verse 35. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be broken. Now, I want to stop here for just a second, because this is like a little thing. He does point out that Scripture can't be broken. Hey, Scripture is a beautiful thing. It it, it is a beautiful prophecy. It can't be broken. And what he's about to do is he's going to show them that their dedication of the Scriptures is going to lead back to him. Look at verse 36. So Scripture can't be broken. Do you say... Of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming. Now, I want these words to be be very clear in verse 36, because this is where I get excited. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. Do you say of him, what is the one, what did the Father do with Jesus? He consecrated him and sent him into the world. He set him apart as holy and sent him into the world. Jesus says, do you say of this person, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus looks at them and says, look, you don't have to believe me at face value. Yes, I said this. But maybe you could also look at everything I've done that when you look into your law, reflects exactly the prophecies that were made and exactly the kingdom that I have set out to establish. And he says, look, you can can ignore that all you want, but here's the deal. The reality is that I came down from above and the Father sent me here and he consecrated me and made me holy so that, for what reason? So that you can see who God is through me. So that you can see the works that the Father is doing through me. So what does this have to do with how I'm personally seeking to like stay pure from the world? What does this have to do with how I personally let Scripture help guide me through life in the Spirit? Um, I want us to quickly open to Psalm uh, 119. I mentioned we're going to kind of look at the Psalms for a few moments this morning as well. And in Psalm 119, we're going to be at the beginning part, so you can know which page to turn to. Psalm 119 is lengthy. Um, So uh, as we look at Psalm 119, um, what I want us to do is we're going to see a strategy that the psalmist is going to give for making our ways pure. Now, so we see Jesus in John 10 say, look, here's the deal. Your law is beautiful, but you have not let it lead to me like it's supposed to. So... Look at me and know that I've been consecrated to do the work of the Father and so that you can see his works through me. Okay, that's a beautiful thing. We get to Psalm 119, and this is going to be talking to young men, but I want us to let this apply to all of us because I think it's pretty beautiful in this instance. We're going to start in verse 9. I know this is a little bit of a, of a lengthy reading, but I think it's, it's worth it. Let these words sink into your hearts here. It says in verse 9, How can a young man keep his way pure? It's a good question. It's the question we're asking here today. How can we keep our ways pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. and the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is beautiful. How can we keep ourselves pure through all the things that the world is throwing at us? 
Who is the person keeping themselves pure in the church when the Roman Empire was at its height and was doing things that would be an abomination that we couldn't imagine in our world today? Who is the person who, who is a living a life in Jesus who's keep, keeping themselves pure through the dark ages when the, when the church was so politically charged and, and the idea of Jesus sure seemed like people who were looking for power and money? Who is the person keeping themselves pure through a time when, when it was accepted to hate somebody just because of the color of their skin? Who is the person keeping themselves pure in these current times when we're surrounded by all the threats that we talked about about last month that are currently facing us, us constantly. It's the one who's going to set their heart on dwelling in the word of God. The psalmist is, is writing truth that if we're going to let God's word sink into our hearts and change us to consecrate us, as Jesus would use in John chapter 10, we have to be people who are individuals who are seeking a life in who he has called us to be. I want us to like let some of this language sink in here in Psalm 119 and how it's written. It says the phrase, with my whole heart I seek you. This is the idea, like this is just this entire thing of like my entire heart, everything I want is the Lord. There, there's not this like sidetracked thing that I want. It's like, you know what I want more than anything else is to serve my God. I, I, love, I love the phrase, I'm aiming not to sin against you by storing up word in my heart. This is, this is one that, that really hit me. The idea of delighting just as much in the Lord as I do when I'm rich. And that is a thought process that is very difficult for us in our society to wrap our minds around. Where I sit there and, and what is mentioned here in Psalm 119, the idea of sitting there and saying, okay, I delight in the Lord as much as I do when I see money entering my bank account. The money entering the bank account day is a good day. This says, somebody who is keeping their ways pure delights more in the Lord than those days. It says, I meditate on your commandments. It's not a casual Every once in a while, I maybe briefly think about the Word of God. It's this idea of deep thought, allowing myself to dwell on the Lord of God. He says, I delight in your commandments. There's not this idea of the command of God exists and I'm just bummed out I have to do it. No, no, no. It's a delight in the commandment of Jesus. If I want to be somebody who is pure in a world where everything is pulling me all these different directions, I must somebody who allows my attitude towards the Word of God Reflect what I see in Psalm 119. If I'm somebody who, who loves the Word of God, who meditates on the Word of God, who cherishes the Word of God, and constantly consumes the Word of God, and I am personally seeking it constantly in a way, and I want this to be clear, in a way that is not simply to have religious knowledge, but in a way that is seeking life in the Spirit and true growth in the Spirit, when I am faced with this temptation that's going to make me impure, when I'm faced with the idols of the world, when I'm faced with the ideas of, of, and I know like this exists all over the place, but when I'm faced with the lust and the greed and the, and the gossip and the lying and the, the drunkenness and all these things that we could sit there and say, those are the desires of the world that I want constantly and that taunt me constantly. If I have allowed myself to try to seek God's word for spiritual growth, what will end up happening is that the word of God will be shouting for me, you don't want that, live for him. It's an attitude of the heart to make the statement, I am seeking your will so that I can be purified. I want us to start tying, tying the bow, tying a knot. You decide, it's up to you on this by tying it all back together by going to John 17. John 17 is just a few chapters beyond what we were looking at earlier in John chapter 10. Except John 17 has had a lot that has happened leading up to John 17. Uh, I, I tell our youth group all the time, like my favorite passage is John 13 through 17. If you read it a lot, like it will impact you significantly. And John chapter 17 is following an entire discussion where Jesus has just laid out what life in the Spirit is going to look like after he leaves. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous statement where he's saying, look, dwell in me, abide in who I am. 
the Spirit's going to come help you in this. And, and he is now going to say a prayer in chapter 17. And so we have this prayer that Jesus prays and it's written down and it's, it's stunningly beautiful. Um, we have started calling it the high priestly prayer is, is what you'll hear people reference it as. And so this is a prayer that follows this massive context of spirit dwelling. And, and I want us to notice uh, in verse 8, it's going to talk about, and I wish we had time to read all this, but, but we're going we're gonna to just notice a few things from it. In verse 8, Jesus is going to mention, he's going to be praying about individuals, and he's going to say a certain type of individual, and that individual is who he's praying about in this prayer. Look at verse 8. For I have given them the words that you gave me, all right, what's he given us? He's given us his words. It's kind of what we've been working through a little bit, right? Psalm 119 referenced the words. Uh, John 10, the law was there, directed back towards Jesus, okay? And what was Jesus here for? He was here uh, so that he was, he was consecrated by the Father to come to earth. He says here, I've given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and they've come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Who's the person he's praying about here? It's the individual who hears the words of God and says, I believe them, and I believe that Jesus is the one who came to this earth to save me, and that God sent him here. All right, so this is, this is a big deal. It's the ones who have allowed the word to not just be present, but have allowed the word to change their lives. Then we move on to verse 16. We're going to see this, this calling exist. It says, they, this is the, about, about the people who have believed that the Lord sent him. Verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Jesus looks and says, who's the person we're talking about? We're talking about the individual who's not of the world. The one who has said, you know what? I'm going to take up my cross and follow Jesus just like Jesus had to do. Those are the individuals it's talking about. We're sitting here, we're taking these idols of the world, the things that we're obsessed with on this earth that, that consume us, that, that take priority over God. And we're sitting there and we're taking them and saying, you know what? This isn't what I'm looking for. I'm throwing them to the side. Those are not what matter to me anymore in verse 17, what's the reaction when we are not of the world? Jesus is praying this prayer to God, and he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. What's his word do for us? It sanctifies us. It does this idea of, of setting us apart and it sanctifies us. We live in his truth. And here's the part that I, I just like, uh, I, it, it, the, the fifth and, I'm teaching the fifth and sixth grade class right now. They said I always say I want to jump for joy like every week. This is the part that makes me want to jump for joy. Okay, like this is the part where I, I, I get like, like I'm, I'm so pumped about this. The same Greek word that is used in John 10 and John chapter 17 is the exact same Greek word. So this is the same word here. In John chapter 10, what it's referencing is who is consecrated. Jesus Christ is consecrated and sent into the world. In John chapter 17, he's looking at you and I and a word that's been almost exclusively used for this idea of Jesus being sanctified on this earth is suddenly used about the people who are going to be his followers. And he says, look, in this process of looking at truth, in this process of looking at what is beautiful, he says, sanctify them in your truth. Give them the Jesus treatment to set them apart. Like I said, the same Greek word that is used here is used here when we have the living truth of Jesus Christ inside of us. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. And what's the reason that Jesus was consecrated? 
sanctified, if we're going to use those words interchangeably. What's the reason he was? It was so that the works of his father can be seen through him. And what's beautiful about this is that you and I get to, to, to walk out of here today and we get to say, you know what? I have been sanctified in the same way that Jesus was consecrated. And what it means is that I get to go out into the world and show people the works of my father every single day. If we want to live a life in this world, fighting off the desires of the world, abiding in the spirit, um, and living in the holy nature of Jesus, we have to be individuals who are letting his word be present on our hearts and allow ourselves to be set apart from this world for his glory, just as he prayed in his prayer. And we can be people who are set apart to do his works. Here's the question I asked today, or the statement. His word allows us to find a place of purification because they lead us back to Jesus. I want to say that again one more time because I think sometimes we can sit here and we say, his words allow us to reach a place of purification because we follow his law. No, 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 no. What Jesus mentions over and over and over again is that his words allow us to find a place of purification from the temptations and things of this earth because like the Jews missed, because they lead us back to Jesus. The question is today, have I let the word of God purify me by leading me to Jesus? Uh, this morning, um, I don't want to offer a, a big fancy invitation, but what I do want to say is that if you look at your life today and you feel like you are in a place where you look at your life and you say, I have been letting all the things of the world distract me. And the last thing I've done is I haven't allowed the word of God to touch my heart. I haven't allowed him to purify me in the way that he has called me to do. Uh, we want to invite you forward this morning um, so we can pray with you. Also, there, I'm sure there are many in this room who have not made the decision to put on Christ in baptism. Who have not made the decision to sit there and say, what I want to do is be buried with Jesus and be raised again with him so that I can be saved through the beauty of the blood of Jesus. If there's anything we can do for you this morning, please come as we stand and as we sing.